Okay, so back to me again now for transaction level Verilog. So I'll start with the big picture methodology behind transaction level Verilog, then we'll go into the language, give you a taste of it, and explain a few more concepts using the ring example, and then I'll introduce you to some of the TL Verilog tool stack. So looking now at our big picture methodology for transaction level Verilog, uh, back to our familiar picture, uh, just slight modifications for transaction level Verilog. So our high level model now we label as transaction level. Verification is focused on there. This model specifies our behavior in a cycle accurate way. Uh, but register transfer level details are provided through correct by construction physical attributes. Um, and this transaction level model is both timing abstract and uh, understands transactions and that statement will make more sense as we go through. Um, also, you know, noteworthy about the methodology behind transaction level Verilog is that it's built on top of Verilog as its name suggests. It, the focus is on taking the methodology that we have today and the tool stack that we have today with RTL based design and introducing mechanisms to raise the abstraction level, both by simplifying and by making it more powerful. Um, so supporting an incremental adoption of new methodology. So I'm going to start by explaining the concept of uh, timing abstraction as it applies to transaction level Verilog. Uh, pipelines give you the context that's necessary for a timing abstract description of your design. So I'm going to uh, explain timing abstraction through this simple pipeline example. So this is a computation of Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, it's a fairly deep computation, so we need to pipeline it. It can't fit all within a single cycle. So we distribute the calculation here over three cycles. And you know, never mind the fact that square root itself probably takes many cycles. We'll just uh, simplify by assuming it's a single cycle in itself. And so we have in the first stage, we're squaring A and B. In the next stage, we add them together. And then in the third stage, we take the square root. And that gives us the distance C in this triangle. So that's the RTL picture of the pipeline logic. In a timing abstract um, mentality, we would give ourselves the context of a pipeline depicted in the lower diagram here. Um, and that pipeline has pipeline stages and the logic is distributed amongst those stages. And you'll see in this, or notice in this picture that I have not drawn the flip-flops. The flip-flops are implied by the fact that we have signals going from stage one to stage two, or in this case, we would call these pipe signals. And they represent not just the signal where it's assigned, but that signal and any staged versions of that signal. Looking now at the code, so the code is a very direct reflection of the picture. Uh, very close correlation here, as you can see, it's just declaring that we have a pipeline, we'll call it calc, it has three stages, and the logic is within the stages. The syntax for the logic expressions is, other than the fact that we have these dollars now on the pipe signal names, is Verilog expression syntax. So comparing this with system Verilog, um, you know, I won't go over the code, but you can see a very nice code reduction. The code reduction is nice, uh, but it's not the main point. The main point is that you can safely and easily um, make changes to the timing of your design. I can't tell you how much of my career was wasted just moving logic from one cycle to the next. And depending on your methodology, um, Synthesis tools are very good at retiming logic, and you can leave that up to synthesis. There's still motivation to at least uh, approximately time your design at the source code level from the standpoint of just being able to understand and express the logic in the way you want to think about it. Um, and we've also done some experiments that, that show kind of mixed results with the synthesis. There are things that impede synthesis from being able to do retiming. Um, and so there are very real motivations to be explicit about the timing in your source code, and TL Verilog allows you to do that. So here, if we assume that we're using the same computation, but it needs to be distributed across our chip, so we need to add some cycles of latency uh, just for transit. So we need to implement the picture at the bottom, and we can do that 
very simply by just changing the, the stage bucketing, changing the stage attributes in our code. This has no impact, is guaranteed to have no impact on the behavior, um, but it changes the way the logic is distributed. And you know, if we look here at the impact that has on the Verilog level of code, it's very disruptive and very bug prone to apply this change at the Verilog level. So the transaction level, level model itself is timing abstract. And that means that all the verification models now are connecting to this timing abstract model. And to illustrate that, um, I'm adding some assertions to this calc pipeline. So the resulting calculation of C should always be greater than or equal to the distance of the legs A and B. And I'm assuming that the, the distances are positive. <clears throat> so you'll notice here that these assert statements don't have any time reference. Uh, the signals A, A, and B, B are produced in stage one of the pipeline, uh, or at least available in stage one of the pipeline. We're assuming they're inputs. And this assertion is in stage three. The context of the pipeline provides the necessary information for the uh, checkers to know that they have to uh, essentially flop uh, A and B forward in order to do the assertion. <clears throat> All right, so moving on now to our ring example. Let me grab a pointer. Okay, so our familiar ring picture here, um, and I've redrawn that with a transaction uh, level mentality. Uh, timing abstract by giving this the context of a pipeline called ring. And I'm putting all of the logic in stage one of that ring pipeline. So this is kind of a degenerate case where we, we have a pipeline that only has logic in a single stage. And that's perfectly fine. We still get the benefit of having the pipeline context for the benefit of timing abstraction. If we need to retime this logic, um, you know, we find that there's a critical path and there very well might be a critical path with the control logic uh, selecting the appropriate data in the MUX. And we wanna optimize this for the, the data uh, flying through this ring. So if we need to move the control logic earlier, we might need to move it to stage zero so that the control signal is set up for the MUX to select the data. And we have the flexibility to do that. Okay, so uh, looking at the code, we're defining a generic uh, component for this uh, ring. It'll be given a name where it's instantiated and we'll put ourselves in that uh, context. We have a, um, any number of nodes for this ring. We'll leave that generic and that can actually be defined externally how many nodes we have. Each node will have a ring pipeline with logic in stage one. And the first thing we put here is the, uh, we establish the ring topology, the, the connectivity from the previous node into this node. So if you look up here, we're, we're grabbing things from stage two of the previous node and driving them into stage one of this node. So here we're reaching into that previous node and the previous node is uh, the node index plus one uh, mod four to give us the cyclic connection. And we reach into its ring pipeline. And this reference here can be read ahead by one. So ahead by one in this case would be our stage one plus one would put us in stage two of the referenced context. And we're grabbing anything from that context and driving it forward. The reason for this relative stage reference is that using relative references actually preserves the timing abstract nature of this design, the property that we can cut any logical statement out of a particular pipeline stage and put it into another pipeline stage and the behavior is preserved. Um, I won't say anything more than that given the length of the talk. Um, so the next thing here is the, the MUX for the data for the, we'll call it a transaction, you know, the, the packet or package or flip, whatever you wanna call it. In TL Verilog context, we'll call it a transaction. So we are selecting that transaction either from the ring, the previous node in the ring, which is in from ring context. So if we're, if the previous node is, has data that's continuing on the ring, then we will select that data. 
Otherwise, we'll grab it from this from node context where the input is made available. The other lines here, the other statements are the, the control logic. So is this valid? Um, and we um, can provide a reset here. Make sure the ring is empty when it's initialized. Uh, are we, is the, the transaction exiting or is it continuing? So that's, that's the whole uh, generic model for the ring. So nothing in here is particular to how many nodes there are with the actual exception that I poured a hard coded for in here, um, but that's not necessary. And uh, generic to the actual transaction that's flowing through this component. So we would refer to this component as a transaction flow component. Now we move on to uh, tools. And I'm going to actually exit out of my presentation here into my web browser, where I've got a couple sessions of Makerchip up and running. So Makerchip is a platform that's provided by Redwood EDA for open source development of TL Verilog and Verilog models. And I've opened up the design that we were just looking at in the presentation. Um, and it's also got a little test bench here, just driving random stimulus to the, the inputs in from node and instantiating the ring. Uh, when I compile this, which I've already done, but I'll kick it off again, I get a logic diagram of my design. And so here's the input coming in from our test bench. So that feeds into this uh, MUX, uh, which is here. And you can see as I highlight things in the diagram, they highlight in the, uh, in the code uh, here as well. Um, so that MUX enters the from ring for the next, uh, the next node and so on. And the control logic is represented here. So, you know, valid signal, um, also cross highlighting in the waveform viewer and continue and exit. So as you're debugging the model, if you see something funny in the waveform, you click on it, you might want to find it in the logic diagram, trace it back to the source code, uh, and make the, the change. So it's a nice, uh, tight, compact, uh, you know, fairly lightweight um, environment to do all of your development from you know, design to debug. Um, I've opened this up as well to show you guys kind of a sneak peek of a feature that's um, in the works called Visual Debug. So this is our same model, um, but in this one, I have uh, created some code for custom visualization within this platform. Um, and that creates this visualization of our ring, which we can step through and see the packets, uh, our transactions marching around the ring and finding their destination. So the great thing about this visualization is that, um, well, first of all, you can use this with Verilog as well, but when you use it with TL Verilog, you get some really nice uh, benefits including that it can be encapsulated with your TL Verilog components. So our ring component, we could provide some visualization for that. Um, and it sort of goes along for the ride as you use this component. Um, external, in this case, you would define the visualization for the transaction, and then the, the component would utilize that visualization. Right. Over here um, in the code view, this is some of the visualization code, which I, you know, I won't explain it in detail given the time, but. Um, you'll notice here that the visualization code is referencing signals in their native TL Verilog style and that these references are also linked with the diagram to help you develop the visualization. So jumping back to the presentation. So just a couple other quick screenshots of visualization that we've put together so far. I'll skip this one. That wraps up my portion on TL Verilog. I'd like to very quickly try to summarize the three presentations that you've seen. Hopefully I can do them justice. So Jan from Cubay Logic presented for us Clash. Clash is built on uh, principles of functional programming. Functional programming is inherently parallel. Uh, it's inherently a specification of functionality. It's inherently executable and therefore you you by specifying the model get a an executable simulator out of that um, we saw extreme ab abstractions uh, for example the 
um, use of embedded language as data types, which can be used to uh, characterize instruction set architectures. Um, you know, I know there's so much to the language that uh, 15 minutes really isn't enough to do it justice. Um, we saw Pyrope from Jose from uh, UC Santa Cruz. Pyrope natively supports a uh, development paradigm of fluid pipelines, which are extremely clunky to code in RTL, but Pyrope makes it very natural. Um, and this gives you sort of data protection, um, preventing bugs in the control logic, preventing data from being lost, um, eliminating a lot of the more squirrely uh, bugs that you can run into. Um, and this, by the way, you know, as I said, BlueSpec uh, is not represented today. Um, BlueSpec has similar properties of uh, data preservation through their atomic operations. Um, and Pyrope has uh, this nice integration of tools um, where different languages are all connected through a common modeling infrastructure. And through this infrastructure, you can interact with the, the models. And that's utilized also in this live flow capability uh, where development is much more incremental. We've become accustomed in our um, design world to these very long loop design flows. And there's real productivity gains of, of tightening that loop and speeding up development. And of course, I present to TL Verilog um, with a lot of focus on the incremental adoption path, the integration with existing RTL frameworks in Verilog. Uh, introducing timing abstract modeling and transaction level uh, capabilities. I showed you very briefly the makerchip.com IDE for TL Verilog development with a nice tight integration of development through debug. Um, and I gave you a sneak peek of visual debug, which might have your waveform viewer a bit uh, worried about its future. So all of these uh, three methodologies are introducing abstraction so that verification can focus on a higher level model and introducing mechanisms by which we can control the implementation at the register transfer level. So addressing the shortcomings of RTL methodology being too detailed and high level synthesis being too detached. <clears throat> so abstraction, flexibility, and control. And with that, the, the chat will be open. The three of us are all available to answer questions.